Hello there, happy Friday. My name is Julia Hirschberg, the owner of Reactive Physical Therapy um, here in Los Angeles. And um, we are a neurologic physical therapy wellness practice where we really focus on helping people get back to their lives, more confidence, strength, movement um, through uh, therapy and exercise. And one of the things that we do as well is educate other therapists. So today we're talking all things dizziness. In particular, does it come from your neck? And I think this is really applicable for uh, the therapist who maybe doesn't work with a lot of vestibular disorders. Um, and wants to brush up a little bit on this, but also for people who've been experiencing dizziness and wanting to understand where is this coming from and what is the possibility that my neck is contributing to that. So um, that is our topic for today. And a big reason why that we're going to talk about cervicogenic dizziness is that it's very poorly understood, I would say, um, maybe controversial. And I have it. So very personal uh, for me and nothing like learning from your own self about things. Um, and I also have a family member who doesn't live near me. Um, we've been talking about dizziness and trying to understand um, her, her pieces of it. And I've been wondering about cervicogenics. So this one's for you as well. So sharing for the world. And um, let's all dive in together for this. And what we'll talk about today is um, how we might get to the diagnosis. What is some of the testing look like? And then about the, the treatment. And I'm going to even demo, which is why I'm hanging out with some TheraBand here. I'm going to demo a couple of things that I've been doing, thanks to my amazing team here, to help, help me get better myself. So um, one of the first things, and this is going to like, breaks my heart, but we're not going to dive super deep into the potential mechanisms, even though for me, in kind of, I love to try to really unravel it, get into the different pathways and all of that. Um, we could spend a whole day on that. Um, and, but I think to get to some of the nitty gritty of assessment and treatment, I want to dive in more there. And I think um, just think of one pretty simple idea of a potential mechanism. So we'll just very briefly, because this is important about when we're treating it, and you can see the little bullseye here behind me. This is one of the big uh, reasons why this might happen um, and then how we treat it. Um, so stay tuned for the bullseye. Um, but the idea is that one thing that can happen is ha having altered proprioceptive input, so knowing where your head is in space from your cervical spine, in particular the upper cervical spine. And something that I often will tell um, people that I'm working with is that maybe your brain then doesn't know exactly where your head is in space because the information isn't correct. And then of course you're going to get dizzy if, you're, if your brain doesn't know where your head is. Um, and so, you know, the simple idea, so if you've got the cervical symptoms, you've got dizziness, then you would treat those together. Now, for me and many others, why would this happen? Why would neck pain and dizziness go together? Um, you know, why might this occur? So for, for me specifically, I've always had some sort of neck problems. I actually have a little bit too much mobility. I won't demo that here. I have too much mobility in some places and then not enough mobility in others. And I would just sometimes get pain, stiffness in some places, um, end up with some headaches kind of coming from the muscles around there, um, things like that. So I've always, not always, but have had that for a few years. Then I got an infection. I got vestibular neuritis. Very, um, very clear. I've been doing my rehab, getting a whole lot better from that. 
In the midst of that rehab, I also got benign positional vertigo, which can go hand in hand with the vestibular neuritis. Um, but I've had a host of these vestibular issues that really literally got me spinning. I mean, I was, I fell down in our yoga class when it was really acute. And um, what you can imagine when you have this dizziness is that you would actually stiffen up your neck, right? It's only natural. You're having a hard time staying up right. And so you, you got to hold it tighter. And even though I was super aware of what was happening, I still naturally was holding my neck more stiff because when my head moved, I would sometimes fall over. And that was really, could be really scary. So that definitely exacerbated my neck pain. And this is so common. So people who may have a prior vestibular problem, like I did, they may modify, they may restrict their head movement, um, and then alter the normal cervical spine mechanics, and then lead then to dizziness from the neck. Um, and I'll talk a little bit next about then how how would you find that out, right? This is very tough because there's not just one test, right? The diagnosis is based on a whole host of signs and symptoms. And a big piece is the absence of a pure vestibular or neurologic cause. And that's really, really important is that you have to rule things out. It's a diagnosis of exclusion. And these are some of the most difficult diagnoses in the healthcare world because it means you need to be really good and systematic with your history taking and your assessment. So in essence, ruling everything out. And I'm going to give you a little laundry list of many things that have to get ruled out so that you can then rule this in. So things like the benign positional vertigo, which is something that I had had just a couple weeks ago. A vestibular hypofunction, also something that I had. So a, a lesion to, uh, for me, it was an infection that um, caused a neuronitis. I had it on one side, but you can also have it on both sides. Um, central vestibular disorders, so vestibular disorders that are from somewhere um, where all of this information gets integrated in the brain and the brain stem. Medications can cause uh, dizziness, right? Blood pressure changes or some cardiovascular causes, autonomic nervous system causes, vestibular migraines. This was something that we were investigating for myself, like, is this what's happening now for me? Um, so there's a lot that we, that, that you want to test through, go through a subjective exam to understand um, those pieces and rule those out before you start looking at the net. Now, Definitely you can have more than one thing, and that's very common. But a good clinical exam is super, super important, and this is exactly what I did with my good friend Robin Howard. So shout out to Robin, um, who is uh, my very, very close friend. She also leads a big part of the practice at USC, and in particular vestibular. Um, but I, we spent a lovely Saturday morning at the clinic, trying out actually her new vestibular first goggles. I got to be the first person to use them um, and um, go through testing to make sure, because we had already, I had already been tested. I had had the vestibular hypofunction. I had the BPPV, but I was still dizzy and it didn't seem to quite fit. So she wanted to make sure like, look, are, do you still have those things? Is that still what's going on? Is it a central disorder? Let me rule things out. And we went through a really thorough exam and got to rule out everything, really everything under the sun, which made me feel so good, to be honest. And Robin is so thorough and so good at this. So um, we, we did that. And then when it came to looking at my neck, it was like, Oh, here is the problem. And so excluding the other things, ruling in the neck. And so this is where all those good skills of palpating, joint mobility, um, all of those skills that we learn early on in PT school come into hand to really rule in the neck as the cause. Um, or the potential cause, right? So we, we can't say anything for certain. There are a couple of tests that 
can be helpful. So there's a head and neck differentiation test. And so this is um, basically you're sitting in a, in a swivel chair. And what you look at is stabilizing the head, but rotating the body underneath it and this and, and if you're getting dizzy with that it actually can implicate the cervical spine being the issue and you need to compare that to actually swiveling the whole body together so everything together like moving on block would indicate more that it's vestibular now it's quite possible that you have both and early on for me when I was in the midst of acute vestibular hypofunction I would likely have had both going on but now really indicated that it was it was more cervical spine um, for me another quick simple test would be to simply do traction and sitting and see if that changes the symptoms um so again addressing the cervical spine and seeing if it changes the dizziness so again just another way to help confirm that and then one of my favorites that gets back to the mechanism is the joint position error so this is why i sat um alongside our little bullseye here. So um, I don't know if a lot of you know who Rob Landell is. He's one of the faculty at USC. Early on when I started working in outpatient um, clinic, I um, took his cervical spine course, cervicogenic dizziness course. He's really well known in this field. And um, as part of the course, you get your little bullseye, which essentially looks at the margin of error for knowing where your head is in space. And so I'm not going to do the whole test because I tried it and it's really hard for you all to see. But um, basically you wear a headlamp um, and I won't shine a laser in your eye, but you wear a headlamp and you look at the bullseye. So imagine I'm looking at the bullseye. The head laser is right at the center. I know where the center is. And then I close my eyes, turn my head, and then try to find my way back to center. So essentially, can my brain tell, can my, is my neck telling the correct signal to my brain to find the center again after I turn my head? So this was really off for me. So four and a half is kind of that, that um, cutoff point, four and a half degrees, and this was really off. Now the good news is that I can train it, but this was a way to look at, oh, the proprioception in your neck is impaired and this can cause you to feel very dizzy. And by the way, the, the, uh, it's not always dizziness that you feel. It may be that you're feeling that you are moving or the environment is moving. Sometimes people have it with a headache as well. Sometimes it's feeling like kind of like you're on a boat. Um, so it can, it can vary what people experience when they have cervicogenic dizziness. And those can be really momentary or they can last for a long um, time. So that, that's really important to consider as well is that it's, it's really quite individual. Um, but what's nice about this, this test, we use this test in a lot of populations, is that then it becomes treatment. So I have my little laser lamp at home, I have my target, I have some other things that I trace to work on my neck proprioception. And I find it rather fun, to be honest. So um, one thing that's very, very important is there's not a one size fits all for treatment, it's so individualized. So you might look like, are there areas of restricted mobility? Or is there hypermobility? So for me, I have a little bit of both in different areas. Um, is, are there areas of increased muscle tone? Are there trigger points? Is there a postural issue? Is the joint proprioception off? Like that, that is for me. Um, what is really important is that it can be any of those things contributing to the to the neck problem. And there's not like a, there's not one way. You don't work on mobility for everybody. For example, for myself, is that if you worked on mobility in those areas where I was very hyper mobile, I would get worse. So a very careful exam by a PT who I would say understands really well both the neck and the vestibular system. So this was when 
I was talking to one of my family members that doesn't live nearby. Um, I said, let me do some research and find a good therapist near you who understands both of these systems because I'm well aware that if it, it's not managed well, you can get worse. And I didn't know if she had cervicogenic dizziness, so I wanted somebody to have a really good differential diagnosis um, process, rule in, rule out um, other things. So one of the big pieces, one of my favorite pieces for myself is working on that cervical spine posture and stability and endurance of some of the deep muscles. So deep neck flexors is one of them. And um, one of my favorite exercises is from our very own Ali Elder, um, who I worked with for quite a while, posture wise and neck wise on and off just as we're as we're here in between patients and things like that. And I'm going to show you it even though it gives me this terrible, ugly double chin. Um, but it's my favorite from Allie. So it's, it's your traditional deep neck flexor with some resistance and then an added little thoracic spine. So you put this behind the head, and I gotta get it in just the right spot, and then you're gonna press into it. So that's your deep neck flexor. What I have to be really careful is to not overly activate my superficial flexors like the sternocleidomastoid. So I had I like to do it in the mirror so I can look to see if those other muscles are like er like that or they're not. Then I know I'm getting deep neck flexors. And then the other piece, this is a piece that I really loved Ali adding and I don't know that you'll really be able to see it here, but it was a little extension through my thoracic spine so that I could get that deep neck flexion with extension. So essentially the external cue that I, I think about, I love the external cues, is um, like, a, like a necklace right here on the sternum and that, that necklace is going forward to get thoracic extension with the deep neck flexion. Now this is very specific to me because I have difficulty with thoracic extension. So that's not everybody's case, but that was a really nice way to combine that deep neck flexor. I think a lot of people have done that lying down in different positions, endurance holds, feedback, and stuff like that. But this was a very functional way for me to work on it. I in sitting, in standing. So I, I do this almost every day. Um, and for me, in my program, this combination of posture, neck stability, some pieces of mobility where I am restricted, and the joint position training, so training my proprioception, that's the program that I needed. Now, I have tested other people with cervicogenic dizziness where we've ruled out other causes, and that's not what they needed, right? They needed a lot of upper cervical mobility. Um, they had really restricted neck range of motion, trigger points, and that was what worked. So again, I'm gonna just reemphasize not a one size fits all approach and really finding a good therapist um, to understand that. Now, here is the good news. The majority of people with cervicogenic dizziness, when they can uncover that, um, they can improve, and they can improve with addressing the neck problem. How do you like my shawl, by the way? I just realized I still have this around my neck. Um, so there have been studies on this. Um, approximately 75% of people improve with pretty conservative treatment of the neck. For other patients, improvement will include addressing the neck, but also doing that vestibular therapy. And honestly, I'm still doing my vestibular exercises to keep um, up that because I'm not that hypofunction. That was just, what, six to eight weeks ago, I guess. And so there's still things in super busy environments when I'm running and I've got the dog pulling and things like that, that I'll still get a little, um, a little residual of the hypofunction. So combining the neck with vestibular um, and a graded exposure to those environments that make you dizzy is very important. So again, I think about my family member who had told me that like going into stores can be the a big piece of it. And so I think about busy environments and that's kind of, I think 
about particular stores. I don't know, Bed Bath & Beyond um, is something I think about in particular because they have like stuff stacked to the ceiling and like it can be very visually overwhelming. So that's like the maybe the pinnacle or the airport, another pinnacle, the moving sidewalk on the airport carrying things. You got kids, you've got, um, you're listening for announcements. That's kind of the like end stage of the game for, for your progression of activities. So there you have it. Not a simple picture or diagnosis. Um, and you know what? I'm certainly not an expert on this. I'm learning from myself, my um, the colleagues, the experts I have around me. And there's a couple of really great resources, free resources that I will link in uh, the comments because um, they're really helpful to, to me, to be honest. And in particular, if you have dizziness and it doesn't fit the typical pattern of many vestibular disorders and no one has investigated others, no one has investigated cervicogenic, maybe vestibular migraines, we that didn't even like get to talk about that. That'll have to be another topic someday. Um, 3PD, autonomic dysfunction, some of these less understood diagnoses, then get in and see a specialist because you know what? You should not just be having to live with dizziness. Um, so I think that's something that, you know, I've really recognized for myself. Like, no, I'm not just going to like say, okay, well, I guess I'll just live with this and change my, you know, change what I'm doing. I might have to temporarily, but with great help with a great physical therapist, I, I'm so lucky to be surrounded by them here. No, like dizziness is not going to be a part of my life forever. And um, I don't want it to be a part of yours either. So thank you so much for joining me. I would love if you have any questions, comments, please put them in the comments here and I'll post those links as well. And um, we'll see you next week. Thank you.